Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Jeremy Roberson. I'm going to talk today about how to improve resolution at the edge and why it's so important. Jeremy, there's been a lot more activity at the edge. The edge is now being defined. Why do we need higher resolution? So across the industry, not only in the commercial landscape, but also in the R&D, everyone has been seeing a move to more and more resolution. And it began a few years ago with some new neural networks that were introduced that instead of doing very low resolution, they've started to increase that because by increasing the resolution, you're better able to detect objects that are very, very small and have minimal features as well as very, very large objects. So this multi-scale visual problem has been better solved um, with these larger resolution networks that started in research and, de and development in the universities with these newer, latest and greatest networks. And those have been rapidly adopted by customers and um, commercial vendors that are attempting to deploy these networks to solve their problems. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Jeremy, what are we looking at? Yeah, so in this picture here, on the, top or on the upper left, you're going to see multiple different vision applications that are solved at the edge. There's classification, in instant segmentation, but the one that we're particularly focused on is object detection. And the problem of object detection is twofold. First, you need to be able to locate a specific object of interest within a visual scene. Second, you need to properly classify what that object is. And in this particular case, you've got three objects of interest, cat, dog, duck. And the way this is solved traditionally is through convolutional neural networks, which I've shown down here. And these networks are a large combination of individual convolution layers that run and execute on a particular hardware platform. And what's happening is, is these networks are getting larger and larger and larger. And so in order to meet the new demands for accuracy, what we see is that these networks are each layer is getting larger. This input image is becoming higher resolution and you're getting more of them. So it's becoming very computationally expensive. So how do you solve that? Yeah, so in the research area, the way that researchers have solved it is instead of deploying one very large network that's one size fits all, they partition the problem up into varying degrees of accuracy. So they offer a family of models, the smaller models in the family. In this particular case, this is the YOLO V5 family of object detection networks. Your smallest networks will run the fastest. So they'll run on the smallest hardware, the smallest power consumption, but they do not give the accuracy that um, some customers want. As you go to the far right, you get bigger and bigger models that have bigger image resolution coming in, they've got more layers, they've got much better accuracy and performance, but they become very computationally expensive. Reality though is, is everybody always wants better re resolution, right? So how do you solve that? What we have been seeing is that most people do not want to compromise on their end performance on their application. They want the highest precision. So what we do, if you look at this plot here, you're going to see that accuracy is on the x-axis and people want to live up here. But to do that, to order to get the highest performance, they need to move further to the right, which means that they're taking longer and longer to do their inferences. But a lot of these video cameras are running at high speed. You can't do both. So the solution to that problem is to design hardware that can be able to handle the highest perform, the largest network, get the best accuracy, but to still meet the inference requirement times of 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. And um, that requires specialized hardware. You've got a lot of different potentially uh, much better resolution as you go forward because you've got all these different versions of YOLO. How do you stay on, uh, stay current while at the same time delivering the maximum performance? That's a great question. So typically there's a trade-off. In ASIC, it gives you the best performance in terms of execution time, but it's not that current. If you end up changing the model, then your ASIC may or may not be able to address it. So basically you're making a trade-off here. How do you solve that problem? Because what you're trying to do is get to maximum resolution at the lowest possible uh, overhead in terms of power performance. You want maximum performance, you want uh, low power, and you want to do it as, as best you can, but you also want that flexibility to go forward. Yeah, that's correct. And so the way that we solve that is 
a lot of these networks, although they continue to evolve, there are some basic fundamental building blocks that they all share, and that is generalized multi matrix multiplication. And so we can hardwire that aspect that we know will be used in the future, and we've seen that happen. As they've evolved from convolutional neural networks to transformers, which are popular in generative AI, they still keep the matrix multiplication as the primary primitive operation. And so we hardwire that aspect of it, but everything else that's done to make a, a model work uh, has been implemented using uh, soft uh, using EFPGA technology so that we can reconfigure that part of the model uh, on the fly. And really what you're doing, to put this in terms that people understand, is that you're doing more computations in order to get this result, right? Yeah, so we're still doing all of the necessary computations that any of these models will require. So whether you're running it on a CPU or a GPU, if it requires 100 million operations, it's still going to require 100 million operations. But 90 million of those might be done with the matrix multiplying units, which are hardwiring as the ASIC would do. However, the rest of the operations are going to be done with flexible IP in the form of EFPGA. What does this look like in the real world? Yeah, so in the real world, here we have two models from the same family, one targeted for very low form factor hardware. It runs very quickly. And, and that's the YOLO V5S, which is lower resolution. And the other one that we're looking at is the higher end part of the model family that runs on higher resolution images, and it takes the longest amount of time to compute. And so if you look at these two pictures that are being inferenced, the YOLO V5S shows a lot of the cars being detected pretty accurately. However, smaller objects, which are hard to discern, but there's a person standing there, and there's a person crossing the intersection there. Very small, very tiny. If you're not using super resolution, getting these very small objects is not going to be possible. So this particular network doesn't capture them. It also misses some of the larger objects, which are the cars. And to, if you have an application where you need to look at, where you need to find the pedestrians, which is pretty important, then you're going to have to go to the super resolution model. And there you can see this person here and this person here are detected, even though they're very small in the scene. And you're also going to need a very high refresh rate on this too, right? Yeah, typically you're going to need a re refresh rate of 30, 30 frames per second, at least, which is not a lot of time. So automotive is, is obviously one of the key markets for this. Where else do you see this playing out? Yeah, automotive is the key market, but we also see a lot of application in industrial as well. So you can think about sm small robots on a factory floor or cameras positioned in the factory floor in order to understand what's happening in the manufacturing line, as well as biomedical. So looking at medical images and being able to detect you know, uh, cancerous tissue, things like that. And this gets integrated with machine learning or AI so that you can react automatically to what's, what's going on there, right? Yeah, this is a key component of uh, an entire uh, intelligence system at the edge. So you might have a camera first that is able to detect an object of interest, automatically react to it, and then zoom in on the object or do something else automatically. You could take another picture, and that time maybe you want to detect the face of this person. Maybe you have a system that wants to do something a little bit more intelligent than just say that, that, that there's a person. And you want to be able to build an entire system that's completely automated. And so you'll see AI at multiple levels. How much programmability can you build into this and what can you do with that programmability? Yeah, so uh, the way that any AI application is handled or most of them with deep learning is you train some kind of deep learning network and you can train it to any application you like. You can train it over audio, video, anything. And so a typical data scientist will train their model for any application that they want to target. After that, they're able to compile that model and use it in our technology um, without any intervention. And how scalable is this? Because obviously you're going to have different needs as you go into different markets and even for different applications within the same market. Yeah, so there's two different issues of scalability. W one is, is that if you have a very large model, we can actually handle 
a model of virtually any size, meaning of all the models that we've seen, we haven't seen a model that's too big to work on our architecture. And the reason for that is because we have very fast reconfiguration, and because we have an EFPGA that can reconfigure itself, each layer in the model could be a thousand layers, two thousand layers, however many thousands of layers. The chip will basically just reconfigure along each and every layer step by step. And so it can scale linearly with a number of layers very easily. The second part of scalability is on the hardware side itself. What you're doing here is sort of cutting the difference between software-defined hardware and the typical hardware design, right? That's correct. So here is a picture that illustrates this best of both worlds approach, hardware and software. So in the middle, we have this EFPGA fabric. And this EFPGA fabric is fully reconfigurable. So for each layer of a neural network, no matter which type of neural network you're trying to run, the software tools will target your specific application and figure out how to program this EFPGA for your specific application. So that's and this EFPGA part is the bridge between hardware and software. And in addition to the EFPGA, these are the hardwired units. So there are what we call tensor processing units. And these tensor processor units are where, bulk, where the bulk of the deep learning computation is going to take place. Each one of these does matrix, intensive matrix vector multiplications, which are the primitive operation of any neural network. These are completely hardwired, just as you would see in an ASIC. So they're very efficient in terms of power, area, and computation time. In addition to that, there's localized memory on the chip itself so that you have a lot of locality between the data that you need to process and the compute engines that are actually doing the processing. What have people been doing up till now? What have they been using? Yeah, so up till now, people have been doing uh, multiple different approaches. One approach is the full FPGA approach. So instead of having these TPUs that are hardwired, and optimized, the whole thing will be FPGA, so that you have to run the entire network on the FPGA, but that's not that efficient from a power and area and speed perspective. The other approach that has been done is that people get rid of the EFPGA portion and they replace it with completely hardwired. So not only do you have these, these TPUs, but you have a hardened control path which connects these TPUs together. And if you do that, yes, you're more efficient in terms of power, performance, and area. However, if you get a new model that comes out that drastically changes how these TPUs need to be connected, all of a sudden, that hardware is no longer going to be applicable to that new application. You've got customers and applications with very different needs out there, though, right? So some of them may need the, the fastest processing and the, the highest resolutions. Other may, others may not need it and really don't, don't want to pay for it in terms of the overhead, in terms of power and performance. It's a great question. So the way that we make a decision on to how to structure the hardware solution for each application is first we understand the application requirements. So on the far left, Perhaps you have a very, very small autonomous robot. It does, it, it's, it's moving very slowly, and the images coming in are very slow. So you might not need as many inferences per second performance as you would in another application. So once you understand that application, then you look at the variety of networks that this particular application might want to run to solve its problems. And you see some, these are all object detection networks. And on a single tile, of the InfraX IP, you can see that you can inference at 19 frames per second in this particular example, or up to 200 frames per second in another example. And 200 frames per second is probably more than enough. So you would probably stop at a single tile if you're using this particular network, which is Yolo B5S. However, if, for instance, you need to do something in the automotive space where your inference per second is very high, but you also need very good performance, you might need to choose a Yolo B5L6 um, model for that application because you might want to do small objects, large objects, 
be very high precision because it's a very critical application when you're in a, a, a moving vehicle. In that case, you pick the best model and you've got a very high frame rate and you can do 100 frames per second. In order to hit that performance, you would need eight tiles. And so you can figure out based on your application in terms of the inference time, how fast you need that information, how accurate that information has to be, the model you're going to use, you can then go and figure out how many tiles of the Inferex is necessary. Jeremy Roberson, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Thanks. It was a great time. Appreciate it.